little bit of a switch, but actually not too much of a switch. I'll be talking primarily about alcoholism here, whereas most of the other focus has been on opioids. But I think you'll see a lot of links, and in fact, I was uh, delighted to see some of the points that were made by all three of the speakers ahead of this, because they're relevant to both, and I hope uh, you'll see the relevance of some of what I'm talking about, although focused mostly on alcoholism, uh, to opioids and, and the other addictive uh, drugs. It's a CTSI thing. I have no disclosures. All the work is funded by NIH, uh, NIDA, the Drug Abuse Institute, the Alcoholism Institute, and the Mental Health Institute. And before I start, I'll call your attention to a publication that came out a couple of years ago, November 2016, from the Surgeon General. This is a very nice book written largely for the public, although it has wonderful references that I think many of you will find useful also, as I did, <clears throat> to talk about facing addiction. As has been pointed out before, there's a lot of stigma, there's a lot of uh, dismissal of the various addictions in terms of moral failures as opposed to chronic diseases. Uh, this was the first publication from the U.S. Surgeon General's office to address these topics, and I think it did it quite well. It also put out some graphics. Uh, it was a marvelous film that we saw to uh, start off the day, and, and quite frankly, I think you ought to work to see if that can, that bit of a movie can be a trailer for actual movies. I think it'd be very useful to get that out into the community. There's one piece that I disagree with, because one of the speakers said that one problem with addictions is, and mental health in general, is that people don't know people who have that, and that's not true. The addictions are very common. A substance use disorder will affect on the order of one in seven people, if you look across lifetime. That person has relatives. We all know people with substance use disorders, with mental health issues. It's just not talked about. We talked a bit about the impact of these things on Ohio, but annually to the US, this is a graphic from that same report. Diabetes has gotten a tremendous amount of attention as it needs to as a recurring chronic diseases. The annual cost to the US of substance misuse, abuse, and addiction is considerably higher than that of diabetes. And in fact, the, one of the speakers asked, uh, Dr. Hurst asked, where has alcoholism gone? The cost of alcoholism is in fact higher than the cost of all the other drugs, not by a huge amount, but as you can see here, it's the major part of that. Now, what are we doing about this? This is what we're spending on it. MIDDK spends about two million a year. It's about eight tenths of a percent of what diabetes is is estimated to cost. When you look at addictions, NIDA is spending only a million, uh, a billion, sorry, uh, a million, a billion dollars. I have M instead of B. Um, NIAAA, with an even larger uh, impact of alcoholism, is less than half that, two tenths of one percent of what this is costing. This is one of the reasons why we have continuing problems. We need to work on them more at all levels, community, prevention, treatment, and research. Now, addictive diseases are complex genetic diseases, and I'll be talking primarily about genetics here. This is common for things like diabetes, hypertension, psychiatric diseases, cancers. These are all complex genetic diseases, and these are the diseases that affect literally millions of people. And I was actually pleased when the Surgeon General's report was comparing alcoholism to diabetes in terms of cost, because I've used that comparison for a different reason over the years. If you look at alcoholism and diabetes, they have many similarities. They run in families. People differ in their initial risk. They're affected by genes, by genetics. And both of these are affected by things that one would consider choices or volition consuming something. In diabetes, too many calories is a major contributor. In the addictions, alcoholism and other addictions, it's the substance 
Now, one difference for the substance use disorders in general is we don't have physical tests. You can't do a blood stick and measure blood glucose. They're defined by behavioral problems. They're defined by a checklist of symptoms, DSM. They are, I'll point out, and I'll get back to this a little later, not defined by the amount consumed. They're defined by the problems that consumption causes. They're heterogeneous. The previous definition that was used in this country for alcoholism, DSM-4, is at least three of seven criteria sets. You can pull three things out of a set of seven in 99 different ways. So there are theoretically 99 different ways you could be diagnosed for alcoholism by DSM-4. DSM-5 moved to greater than or equal two of 11 criteria, 2,000 combinations. This is to point out, obviously, they don't all exist independently, but this is to point out that there is a tremendous amount of heterogeneity in these. Heterogeneity in initial risk, heterogeneity in how people fall into these problems, heterogeneity in how we have to treat them. Now, for substance use disorders, there are treatments available. No one treatment works for anyone. The available ones are underutilized but we do need better ones. And again, uh, it was very helpful to have really a, a, an emphasis on the fact that medically assisted treated treatments from Dr. Hurst are really the state of the art. That's true not only for opioids, it's true for alcoholism, although the medications we have for alcoholism are in fact not as, not as good as the ones we have for opioid addiction. But alcoholism, as the other ones, are, are chronic relapsing patterns. Again, we have to consider this throughout the lifespan. Most of the treatments so far for alcoholism have been discovered more or less accidentally. Our goal, the work I do with genetics, is to use the genetics as a way to get into the biology of the disorders, the genes, the pathways involved. Use that both for rational drug design for matching people to the appropriate drug, for helping the outcome by understanding it at a very, very basic level. But there are, as I said, these many, many difficulties. The lack of a biological test, the use of a symptom checklist, the heterogeneity, the fact that we already know there are probably hundreds to thousands of genetic variants that each have a tiny impact on the risk, the environmental variability, the gene-gene interactions and gene-environment interactions that we really need more data before we can dig into in the level at which we need it. These are common to the other psychiatric disorders, some of which I work on. We need to address these. But the added complication with addictions, above and beyond the psychiatric disorders, is that consumption of a drug, alcohol, opioids, is a necessary component to it. This means access to a drug plays a big role. It means laws, regulations, social patterns. These all have a big impact. That is, on the one hand, a complication for studies I do. On the other hand, an opportunity, because one can intervene in these various things and try to reduce the risk. For alcohol, it's extremely widely available and therefore most people get exposed to it at some stage. Opioids, less available, although the overprescription has made it more so in some cases. The fact that consumption is necessary means that when we're trying to do genetics, if we can, we try to compare to controls who've been exposed to the substance rather than controls who've never been exposed because you can't really predict if exposure would lead to addiction in someone if they had the risk factors. This is not always popular, oh, sorry, not always possible. Uh, and some risk variants that we get will almost certainly increase risk across the broad category of addictions, and which particular addiction comes out may well be determined by access. So how can we approach the problem? In terms of learning more about the fundamental biology, my bias is that genetics gives us a very, very nice way in. 
And with current technologies, these genome-wide association studies, the so-called GWAS, are really the way to go. They cover the whole genome with millions of markers. They look at what we call common variation, which these days is typically 1 percent or more, 5 percent in a small study. The reason they're good is they're unbiased. For quite a few years, people in all sorts of fields, not just addictions, have been picking a favorite gene and studying that using statistics based on the fact that they've only tested one thing. And a lot of these candidate gene studies have not particularly held up. The one that I'm going to tell you about here has, but that's really an exception. So, whoops. Why does this not want to go forward? There we go. For the GWAS era, though, there was one initial flash in the pan, and then all of the early psychiatric studies had no or few significant findings, and findings would be inconsistent among studies. This was a real problem until people realized that the issue was the power of the study. You needed very, very big numbers. And the breakthrough really came in the schizophrenia paper when they finally gathered, in this case, 37,000 cases from around the world, <clears throat> although primarily European populations, and that's a point I'll make in a moment. And all of a sudden, they started finding a lot of loci. This is from a paper sort of reviewing what the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium is, is aiming to do. We're looking at finding versus case numbers. In inflammatory bowel disease, it took very few cases to find a lot of genes. Schizophrenia took a while before it took off, but then it took off even faster than height, a common complex trait. Bipolar lagging a bit. It's still on this trajectory. We're hoping we'll hit this inflection point. Major depression on this graph would still be at essentially zero. It took many, many more cases for that to get there. So you really need large sample sizes, and you need meta-analysis to do that. Now, much as I love the GWAS to get you toward these low side of impact, they just find regions of the genome. They don't tell you what the functional variations are. They may be attributed to a gene nearby, but that may or may not be true. There's really a tremendous amount of work beyond that to functional studies to really see what's happening. But the start point, the genetics gives you a start point that you know is relevant to the human condition. And that's why I think they're really important. So how do you get enough cases? First, you need to encourage studies to collect genetic data. And in fact, this is one of my first editorials here, people studying opioids. Think about getting the right IRB approval and the right consent, and collect the genetic material, because this will be useful, not necessarily enable you to get a, a complete study on your own, because your numbers are not likely to be large enough, but to contribute to the larger good. You really need to bring many groups together. GWAS is really team science to the nth degree. To do that, you need to build trust among the collaborators as well as trust with the subjects and patients who you're working with. And you have a lot of other work involved in that. The piece I'm going to mostly be talking about today is through the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium. And I'm one of the heads of their Substance Use Disorders Working Group, the PGCSUD. PGC as a whole involves, at the moment, more than 900 researchers collaborating on various aspects of psychiatric genetics and genomics, and you need that kind of scale. This is team science to the nth degree. What we're doing in the substance use disorder group is targeting a number of substances. Alcohol is our first. Opioids and cannabis are currently underway and going to multiple drugs later. Our initial forays are to target dependence, not use, not amount consumed. There are larger groups looking at amount consumed for alcohol, and as I'll tell you, that's not the same thing. 
We're going to do things like symptom count, harmful heavy use, max drinks, multiple substances. We're already doing some cross-disorder work, both within the uh, various addictive substances, but also across with eating disorders, with major depression, with other psychiatric groups. So today I'll talk about our initial analysis, where I think many of the take-home messages really cut across the different substances. So I mentioned the heterogeneity. I mentioned the picking symptoms out of a list. We've chosen to use DSM-4 dependence, this greater than three of seven criteria in this red box here. Um, two of them, you've just heard a, a wonderful talk about tolerance and the fact that you can dis dissociate that from pain relief with opioids. Tolerance is one of these, withdrawal, negative state is one of those, whoops. Okay, let's wave my hand too, too strongly there. Um, but they're not all of it. Most of the definition has to do with problems that you've hit. So I've already mentioned much of this, but what we've done is taken genotype data from cohorts at the individual level. A few places can't do that for various IRB regions. And our initial study has mostly people of European descent because, frankly, that's where most of the funding has been, so people in uh, US, Australia, Europe, uh, funding these kinds of studies, so there's more data available. We do have a reasonable number given um, the constraints of African Americans to have found something, but still not nearly enough, and I'll again come back to that. So actually, a, a week ago Monday, our first paper came out in Nature Neuroscience. This is a, a wonderful, we got the cover of it. This is a Manhattan plot. People have seen this before in other ways, but uh, actually the, the daughter of one of the group's co-founders is a graphic artist and visualized a, a Manhattan plot for alcohol, disorder, alcohol uh, dependence coming out of shot glasses. Anyway, uh, this article is the one that I'll mainly be talking about in terms of results, uh, which came out again just this past Monday. <clears throat> we had almost 15,000 cases, not nearly enough yet. We think we need several times more to really dig deeper into this. They're predominantly European, but we have a, a reasonable representation of African Americans in this. And our real uh, Manhattan plot shows one big major peak and one little dot elsewhere. We're greatly underpowered. The other thing I'll point out quickly is that there's a gap. We don't have a whole lot of things sitting just below this dotted red line for significance. We do need a lot more samples. But if we bore into this main signal in the trans-ancestral meta-analysis where we analyze separately the African Americans and the Europeans, and then took the summary statistics together because there are a, a number of reasons you have to do that. They hit on a gene that I'd been studying for many years, the alcohol dehydrogenase 1 B gene. The main finding is this one particular SNP that I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, this doesn't show up in the main finding very well, although you'll see it in a moment later. So, ADH1B is associated with alcohol dependence. We've known this, but this is the strongest evidence to date in Europeans for this, uh, basically because of allele frequencies. It's a protective effect, and I'll, I'll talk about mechanism, but this has to do with the metabolism of alcohol. One of the interesting things, and one of the points that I've made already and that I'll come back to, I'm a little repetitious. I'm used to teaching for many years. There are points I make, want to make sure get across. And this is one of them. You have different alleles in different populations. You need to study different populations if you really want to see the range of things that are affecting humans. This is the allele that's common in Europeans. Very good p-value. The minor allele frequency in Europeans, depending on which European group you look at, is somewhere between 0 and 5%. Roughly, it's a little higher in the Middle East, it's much higher in East Asia. A different allele in the same gene was the prominent one in African Americans, also quite significant, and that too ranges in different groups across Africa in allele frequency. There are other alleles that are in LD with them, and these sometimes can cause confusion, 
But just for a moment, the allele frequencies you can see in Africa for the 206702 ranges up and down. These are data from 1,000 genomes. In Europeans, you see it's very low. It was essentially zero in Finns. So if you did this study in Finland, you wouldn't see this effect. Why you need to study more populations. Then the other reason is that the pattern of what's co-inherited in different populations, what we call linkage disequilibrium, varies. So this is the European cases. Here's the key SNP. Very little else is in reasonably strong uh, association with it. So there's not a lot of support from other variants. There's a bunch here that give you some signal. And these, I'm nearly certain, though we don't have the physical, that we don't really have the data yet, affect expression of this gene. Take a quick look at this pattern. So one strong signal, very little else, almost nothing else here, a pile of stuff. This is the African ancestry cases. In this case, these are essentially all African Americans. Here's the lead signal, a very different pattern. Many, many other alleles are traveling together with it. So one has to pick apart what's functional there. So again, you need to study different populations. There are different alleles, different allele frequencies, different patterns of co-association of genetics. There's also different environments, different social structures, and these also make a difference. People think too much in terms of genetic determinism, but it's an important piece of the puzzle. It's one that I think will help us get to some very big answers, but you have to be aware of the wider puzzle. So one size doesn't fit all. I'll mention the idea of a polygenic risk score where you lump the evidence from thousands to, to millions of different variants in the genome to come out with a figure that you can use to roughly categorize risk. And this doesn't translate well across populations for the reasons above. Now, this is a case where we've actually done the functional work to understand these variants before we had all the genetics. This is a very simple pathway of alcohol metabolism. It goes from alcohol to acetaldehyde to acetate. Bunch of genes that code for alcohol dehydrogenases, things that code for aldehyde dehydrogenases. The ADH is four of the six that are prominent in, in US, far sorry, in the genome, are involved in, I keep going back and forth, are involved in this, one main aldehyde dehydrogenase. But the key in between this is that a buildup of acid aldehyde, either prolonged if you block the removal, I'm not used to using my pad quite this way, either a buildup if you block the removal or a transient buildup if you increase the speed of the first reaction, gives you acid aldehyde, which gives you unpleasant feelings. And we believe this is the mechanism through which both of the variants in ADH1B work. Is there more in that region? We found a number of other signals in the region that were also significant in some of the other ADH genes and nearby. But a caveat, and this is a paper which is uh, online now, not yet quite out, um, to point out another problem. A whole bunch of these different variants travel together both in Europeans and in Africans, different patterns here. And so when you find a, a signal, a genetic signal in this region, you have a lot of dissecting to do. And in fact, we think that a lot of the signals that people have found in other smaller studies relate to the fact that the, the variants they're looking at are traveling along with some of these variants that have a very important impact there's independent evidence that a different ADH gene is also important, but there are a lot of things that have been reported in the literature that are very likely to just be not themselves functional, but telling us that one of these functional variants is coming along. Now, that's clearly not the whole story. It explains, it, it makes a major impact on risk. It actually, if you have one of these ADH, the ADH1B uh, variant in, in um, Europeans, it'll cut your risk to about a third, which is pretty good. But if you look at overall risk in a population, it's a very small impact. 
We know there's a lot out there. We know we need big numbers to get it. The other finding we hit was primarily from African Americans on chromosome three, and that we were, we've not yet been able to replicate because there are just too few studies. And this is a, a problem I've come back to a number of times. There are some other things that are of some interest that we need to follow up. So what we found in terms of the genetics was not startlingly new. We actually knew about this gene beforehand. We have a different kind of evidence now. We also have the toehold with the samples we've collected and the work we've done on them to enlarge the sample and find more. But what else did we learn even at this stage when the other individual genes did not pop up? One thing we learned is that dependence and consumption are different. They're overlapped. You can't get dependence without consumption. You can consume without the dependence. There's a modest genetic correlation. In a couple of big studies, it's about 70%. In the UK Biobank, which is a skews toward older, medium income SES people, the correlation is in fact lower, about 37%. Some SNPs are related, some are not. And if we take a look at the, um, the SNPs here for consumption and dependence, some are clearly strongly related in the, in the ADHs, some are not. The genes that have come up for consumption have not shown up. Some of the genes have not yet shown up in dependence, and we think the same will be vice versa when our numbers are higher. There was another study using a somewhat different definition of, for, um, for their phenotype, which is something called the Alcohol Use uh, Disorders Identification Test, or AUDIT. It's a 10-question test that, tests that uh, physicians probably should ask more often than they do, but uh, it, get, it touches into past year's uh, consumption and problems. There are two real parts. The first three part touch consumption. The last seven questions touch problems. And we found that the, in this other study that the consumption questions track well with the genes that have been found for consumption and correlate with it. The dependence questions, the problem questions, correlate well with dependence. So, um, Essentially here, this is all within UK Biobank and 23andMe. If you look at the total score, the consumption, and the uh, problem score, they all correlate pretty well with consumption. You can't have the problems without the consumption. But if you look at dependence, you see that it's on a hair trigger today. You see that the total score and the consumption score don't track as well with dependence as the problem score. And that's because these are population samples. And in population samples, there are a huge number of people who drink very, very little or nothing. And there's 10 to 15% who drink a lot. So you have a very unusual distribution. And in a roughly healthy population, what you're picking up is just the consumption piece at the bottom, which is not at the levels that cause the problems. We also learned there's a lot of comorbidity. We've known this. It's often comorbid with substance use disorders, but we're also finding a lot of comorbidity with externalizing traits, internalizing traits. And we think that some of the genes are contributing to more than one phenotype. These are data from a different study I'm on. This is a study focused on families of alcoholics, um, looking at, at uh, genetics of alcoholism. If you look at all of the people who are dependent on any of these four drugs in this case, and then you look how many are comorbid with something else, we've recruited for people with alcohol dependence. So it's obvious the highest here, and a fair amount of comorbidity. I apologize. If you look at cannabis, you see a fairly high amount, but a large part of it is comorbid, roughly three quarters of it. When you look at cocaine, you're getting up toward the 80, 90%. And opioids, again, most everyone is also dependent on another substance of abuse. 
So again, in terms of an opioid conference, you need to be aware of all of this. And in terms of what you heard from uh, Dr. Hurst and others earlier, you need to treat all of these things as part of a big problem. Here are some genetic correlations, a lot of uh, correlation with initiation of cannabis, smoking, nicotine dependence, cigarettes per day, alcohol consumption, of course. But audit scores didn't correlate very well at all, the genetics of it, with the 23andMe population, because that was primarily this healthy population. A lot of correlation with psychiatric traits, depressive syndromes, depression, ADHD, uh, schizophrenia, and the like. Negative correlation with well-being and educational attainment, not, perhaps not surprising. So I'll mention briefly a couple of other studies that are of interest. Uh, again, for alcohol dependence, we're looking for larger samples. We're looking to drill down into symptoms where in the process of, of working on our initial papers on opioid and cannabis dependence with the other things coming up. For opioid dependence, this is very preliminary, so I, I just flagged it. It's not just unpublished. We haven't finished doing the analyses yet. But we've gathered cases from a fair number of uh, different groups, mostly European again. We only have about 3,400 cases at the moment, but we're on target by the end of the year to get about 4,800 cases. With what we've analyzed to date, we already have some very near hits. Again, I wouldn't take any of these. I didn't put genes or anything on them because this is very preliminary. We have much more data to analyze, but it looks very promising. Cannabis dependence, we have somewhat more cases, but uh, a little bit further from hits again a number of regions that look very promising. So we're trying to bring in more samples and do more work on this. Now, I've mentioned a couple of times before that for these complex diseases, for all of them, many, many loci contribute to risk. The effect size of any one locus is very small. So I'm sometimes asked, why bother to you to do the genetics if you're looking for something that has an effect size of a fraction of a percent? And it's a good question, but it's one that I think we have an answer to. So what do we learn from it? If we can find, the, through these small hints, the genes that are involved, and then the pathways that affect risk, we've made a major step toward the biology of the disease. We've made a major step toward potential targets for treatment. We've learned about patterns of genetic or inherent correlations. We should be able to improve diagnoses. And as some of you follow the other literature, the genetics has made it even more clear than before that, if you, that there's a spectrum between schizophrenia, bipolar, and major depression where they're sharing a lot of the genetic risk factors in a graded manner across that spectrum. So we can reclassify some of these diseases. And I think as we dissect these disorders, based on the biology we learned from the genetics, we'll not only be better able to develop drugs, but we'll be better able to target drugs to the subtypes of the disorders. I'll mention briefly polygenic risk scores. Some of you are not that familiar with it, but they can be pretty useful. Here you're just aggregating the effect sizes of thousands to millions of genes across the genome to index some of the overall genetic risk. And as vague as that seems, and at the moment the alcoholism paper, which is underpowered, this is about 9% of the risk that we're able to follow. But it's still enough to see how that genetic risk plays out longitudinally, how it plays out with different environments to start looking for extreme individuals and see what may be different there. Many, many things we can learn. So again, why bother to find loci of small effects? People, I've mentioned drug development, and one of the questions I've gotten is, well, if, if this gene has a tiny effect on uh, the risk, then a drug would have a tiny effect also. That's not the case. The effect of a drug on a biological process is not limited by either the allele frequency of the variant that you use to find that biological link 
or the effect size of the variants that you use to find the biological link. Even if a variant is rare or the effect size is small, if it leads you to the biology of the disease, you can target a pathway with a blockbuster of a drug. This has already happened. People have learned from rare alleles that, that are carried by very few people much about things like cholesterol targeting, you know, PKSK9 for disorders. So we think this will be useful. If you want to look further at how we think this will be useful, this article came out a couple of years ago in Nature Neuroscience looking at trying to translate what we're getting in these genome-wide studies in toward therapeutics. And clearly we're at early stages, but I think it's going to be the path forward. So how do we move forward? Larger sample sizes. One of the things we're exploring now is combining very large samples with, let's say, weak phenotyping. And electronic health records are wonderful for some things, but for substance use disorders are often underreported. So they're not wonderful um, for that. But if we get large enough samples, the noise pokes out, the noise gets um, sort of levels off and the real signals point out. We need more diverse populations. We need to follow up with functional studies. Uh, where we are on, on this curve, this is using schizophrenia as the example, for the substance use disorders is way in this flat part. We need to move with more subjects to where we're going to be finding the genes. So another editorial to leave you with, not my last, I have another minute for another editorial, is we need more focused studies on the alcohol use disorders, the substance use disorders. We need some very focused studies of samples carefully ascertained and assessed. We need longitudinal studies. This will complement the larger beginning use of some of these population studies. But all studies of these substance use disorders should think about collecting genetic information. And all health studies should get relevant information on substance use and abuse. Alcohol, what I've been talking about now, affects nearly every common disease. But the people studying the genetics of those diseases don't often get the right data to make their populations useful for finding it. My last editorial is I keep trying to stamp out the idea that we're looking for the gene for XYZ disease. There isn't a gene for XYZ diseases. We're talking about complex diseases. Variations in many genes lead to variations in physiology, to variations in risk, variations in the course of disease, variations in the response to treatment. And we need to have this holistic view if we're going to make progress. And with that, I'll end just mentioning that I've talked mostly about work from the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, which you can find on the web and actually on Twitter, uh, funded by NIMH, uh, NIDA, and NIAAA. Uh, the COGA, this collaborative study on the genetics of alcoholism, I talked about uh, um, to a lesser extent funded primarily by NIAAA, and be happy to take questions in the last couple of minutes. Genetic evaluations in these populations. Uh, an excellent question for those who didn't hear about epigenetics. We're beginning to do those studies for um, for some of these, we are basically going to start with DNA methylation because that appears to be the most stable of the epigenetic uh, variations. And to my mind, and this is a, a bias of mine, uh, more likely that you can get access to that when you're taking a sample that you can sample, i.e. blood, uh, from a living person. We're also doing some studies on epigenetics on uh, post-mortem brain tissue in different regions. Um, we just know much less about it yet. There have been a few things published, nothing with really large sample sizes. And I've, as I've gotten into genetics from doing very 
what looks in retrospect like very detailed uh, molecular biology at the bench top, sample numbers are a big issue. So we're, we're going there, but we're not nearly, we're not far enough along for me to talk about. The question is whether we found anything SNPs related to hepatic cirrhosis. We have not, because in the studies we're doing so far, the places we've gotten the data, um, these have been based on psychiatric studies of substance use disorders, and we don't, in fact, have data on cirrhosis from these people. One of the studies, the COGA study that I have mentioned here, is in the process of trying to go back to people who we interviewed who were alcoholic, 20 years ago and try to get current health information on them. Um, we're hoping we can get funded to, to, to do enough of this. There is a parallel study focused on genetics of cirrhosis. Um, it's smaller and it's not yet come out with much, but I expect something will come out within this year on that. Been a very far back. I was just curious, in the, um, the ADH gene cluster, particularly in the African-American population, is there evidence for co-regulation of, of that cluster of genes um, causing that type of signal? Uh, there is some evidence of co-regulation. There are some, um, uh, this is actually what I, what I spend my laboratory time on. Um, it's a little bit complex, but in the, as we've studied it, there is some amount of co-regulation, but there's a, really a lot of independent regulation of, of all of those. Um, one of those genes is expressed ubiquitously across any tissue we've looked at. Um, most of them are expressed in a fairly tissue-specific manner. Um, most have at least some expression in liver, but there's an exception that's expressed only, only in liver and one that's expressed not in liver. So there's a lot of individual regulation there. Howard, um, I have a question on the, uh, um, so you talk about the alcohol metabolism. How about alcohol uh, uh, distribution, transportation, uh, genes related to that family? In terms of alcohol, this is not really an issue because it's highly water soluble and it distributes across all the water in the body relatively quickly. So um, within you know, 15 or so minutes, it's pretty well distributed across interior and exterior water all across the body. Other drugs may have some other issues, but alcohol just gets right into the bloodstream and into cells. 